Okay, so during some research, I came across a very weird piece of information. So apparently, in the year 1787, 900 Indians were sent from the South Indian state of Mysore all the way to Istanbul in the Ottoman Empire. These people took more than two years to reach and when they finally came back to India, their numbers were less than 300. So of course, I immediately had to drop whatever else I was doing and I had to find out what happened to these people. First of all, why did they go there? And secondly, what became of them? Were they killed? Were they treated badly? Why did so little of them return? Hi, my name is Misha and welcome to Tariki Tales. Make sure to like, share, subscribe. And if you want to help support this channel, you can go down below in the description to my Patreon link and fund the channel there. Okay, okay so turns out this was a massive delegation sent by the Sultan of Mysore himself. And the Sultan at that time was Tipu Sultan. Now, Mysore was a South Indian state that was gaining power around the mid 1700s, and the ruling family of the state were the Tipus. The Tipus themselves were Muslims, but the people they ruled contained a mix of both Muslims and non Muslims. Okay, so while researching, I realized that there are two parts to this story. First of all, the why part. Why this delegation was sent in the first place, right? Now that question, I'll answer next week. For now, I want to talk about the journey of these 900 people and their experiences. It's basically like a travel vlog from the 1700s, you know, because we have so many sources and so many pieces of information that are available on these 900 people and this delegation. Now sources include original documents from Mysore itself, for example, things like the instruction Tipu Sultan gave to his vakils, the lead of the delegation. And there's a list of documents, I'm going to put it up here, which are found from Mysore. And then there are also another list of entire documents which are found in the Turkish archives because they also kept records of these people when they arrived there. And one more very important source is, it's kind of like a diary, one of the travelers one of the people from among these 900 people wrote. It's not a complete account till the very end, but it's still very significant, historians say. Unfortunately, I cannot show you the original documents uh, in this video because a lot of them are scattered around in museums all over the world and they're not accessible digitally. So we're going to have to listen to the historians who've kind of dug through them. Okay, so our story begins some years before this actual delegation was sent. It wasn't just like Tipu Sultan just threw these people at the Ottomans like, here you go, handle them. No. A few years before, in the year 1785, a man named Usman, accompanied by another Indian, whose name we do not know, were sent to the Ottoman court to notify them of this bigger procession that will be coming the following years. And according to sources, it said that the Ottomans actually received these people with a lot of respect because they first reached the Ottomans through what is now modern-day Iraq. And once they got there, the governor of Iraq himself, Suleiman Pasha, actually accompanied them all the way back to Istanbul. And on reaching Istanbul, they were actually given stipends for their living, for other necessities, and the documents also mention for baths. Well, to be fair, they needed that because they did just cover about 4,000 miles. Now that was set and done. The Ottomans were notified of this other procession that will be coming shortly. And that procession set sail from the port of Tadri on the Malabar coast in 1786. They reached Basra in August. And when they reach, we find documents again from the Ottoman Sultan this time, um, instructing the governor of Iraq, Suleiman Pasha, to meet them with pomp and dignity befitting our state. Obviously, the governor wasn't in touch with the entire 900 people because as we find out through the Indian documents that the delegation actually had a very, very strict hierarchy. So the two lead vakils, they were on top. They were Sayyid Ghulam Ali and Shah Nurullah Khan. They were basically the leaders of the delegation. And then below that, there was an entire structure as to how the delegation was organized. And Tipu Sultan actually is well known for having a very European style organized military as well. And he kind of displayed that as well with the delegation. Historians also mention that 
this might have been like a little replica of the state of Mysore, kind of representing it, right? So it's very likely that the delegation also included non-Muslims and they also did have women. Everything was so meticulously planned that there are even letters by Tipu Sultan that are kind of detailing the hierarchy of the working staff as well. And these other people included military officials, which are obviously much higher in rank. They also included sweepers and cleaners and torch bearers and translators, scribes, artillerymen, artillerymen. Now these people stayed in Iraq for almost a year. It's a little bit confusing as to why they stayed there for a year because some historians say that maybe the correspondence to and from Istanbul took time also, there were some other factors like when they reached Iraq, one of the ships that were carrying a significant number of people had actually crashed. The ship not only carried people but also carried some of the major gifts that were to be given to the Ottoman Sultan. So this is one of the reasons why the number of people declined so heavily on the return journey. And another reason that we find out is that a lot of the people from the from the delegation were deserting it. They were leaving and they were kind of like getting lost in the Ottoman Empire. They wanted to settle there. And it kind of makes sense if you think about it is because at this time, in the 1750s, India was gripped in turmoil and things were changing politically very rapidly. So obviously, those people wanting a better life, they wanted to go to this empire, which seemed to be much more stable. For now. now, so when these people were living in Iraq, all their expenses were kind of being borne by the Ottoman state. And in fact, there are letters that show the, the Ottoman state kind of emphasizing this point over and over again. And they're using words like Mehman Nawazi, Mehman Darlik, or Mehman Dari. All of these are expressions of hospitality. And in that spirit, they wanted to take care of all the expenses that were kind of incurred on these people. They were given food, staples and supplies. They were given houses to live in. And on the opposite side, Tipu Sultan is actually have said to be a stickler for niceties himself. And he had also instructed his party that if they're being polite and if they're offering things, don't be rude and go on saying no. You have to be very cordial. You have to be very pleasant, very polite. So both the sides were making a lot of effort to be very diplomatically friendly. Now, one thing was kind of making sure that their basic necessities are taken care of, right? But the Ottoman state also wanted that they do more. Mm -hmm. They were basically taken on sightseeing tours and also pilgrimages of the sacred sites, which was called Ziyarat. And these sites were kind of scattered throughout the Gulf. And as many Muslims would know, the most coveted destinations for these pilgrimages were the shrine cities of Najaf and Karbala. And there are proper literally like documents outlining the preparations for taking these people, for taking these 330 people, which were left at this point, to see these pilgrimages. To see these sacred places. So this is how they spent almost a year in Iraq and then in 1787 they started moving towards Istanbul. So in Istanbul again they were given houses, they were given a good amount of food, all the basic necessities were covered and as I mentioned they were given an additional stipend as well. I would have loved this kind of a visit but not really because things go bad real soon. In the December of 1787 is when this group finally meets the Grand Vizier. Because remember, they do have a point in coming here. They have some things they are either demanding or offering to the Ottomans. And we'll talk more about that in the next video. But by this time, all the people in the party were exhausted. And from the 900 people that were initially sent, only 330 kind of basically made it to Istanbul. And now, things take a turn for the worse. Here's a document of the official Ottoman court that shows us a list of the inventory given to this party. But at the same time, it also shows us the names of all these people in the delegation that have died after arrival in Istanbul. And just to be clear, these aren't all. A lot more people actually died as well. And historians account these deaths to an epidemic that had spread throughout Istanbul during this time period. And 
these people who were from outside of Istanbul were greatly affected and a lot of them unfortunately lost their lives to that disease. Another thing that caused some deaths was the climate because as the Ottoman histories themselves mentioned because they realized this they realized that this is an issue even during that time because there's a document that's kind of telling why these people have such a hard time adjusting here and it says India falls among the tropical countries while the lands of Rum belong to the temperate climes. Now it wasn't like the Ottomans weren't trying to help these people. They were because some, from the same documents we can see that not only were they being given staple food supplies that are kind of consistent with other Ottoman documents but just to make sure that these people are comfortable and they're getting food to their taste and liking the Ottoman court also includes other more expensive and more exotic spices at that time like ginger, cardamom, saffron and cloves. And this was done specially for these Indians. And another thing that they were kind of thinking about was kind of moving all of these people who were left to a sea-facing villa once spring arrives because they were hoping that the fresh breeze from the sea would kind of help their health and make things better. We don't know if that happened or not, but we do know is that next year, which is 1788, during the springtime, the Ottomans actually threw a big feast for these people to entertain them and in their honor. And it was more than like a feast. It was like a festival because they also had like sports and like they had places where the Indian soldiers could display their archery, their javelin throws, their shooting skills. And Tipu Sultan had actually made sure that their army kind of follows all their drills and does their practices because he did want to leave a very good impression on the Ottomans. The visitors were also given ferry rides throughout the Bosphorus to kind of show them Istanbul from that view. And they were also given mini maps of the capital to kind of take with them and to kind of see and explore. And it was after all of this that they were finally granted permission from the Ottoman court to return back to India. And now because, as I mentioned, 330 people had gone to Istanbul and so many of them had also died in Istanbul because of disease and climate change. So a very few number of people made the journey back home. And during that journey, they actually made another pit stop. They stopped in Mecca and they performed the pilgrimage of Hajj. So now this was the journey bit. And what was going on politically though, right? What was the delegation doing? And why were there so many people? Usually when you have to send a message, it's like one or two people, right? So let me tell you, a lot was going on politically. And I'm going to be sharing more, as I mentioned, next week. All right. See you guys. Bye. Again, if you want to make sure that I can make such content, please, if you can help me out at the link provided below at Patreon. Thank you.